Resident Evil. No, you're not on the star screen of a classic survival horror video game. This is a Fulcrum Entertainment audiobook. And if you would like to follow the channel and find out more, you can follow us on Twitter at Fulcrum underscore ENT. And if you're looking for any more audiobooks that we do after you've enjoyed this one, go into the description below to find links to all our playlists. My name is Harry, and today I am reading for you Resident Evil Caliban Cove by S.D. Perry. This is an original Resident Evil novel not based on any video game, and is intended to bridge the gap between the story of the first Resident Evil game, slash Biohazard as it was originally known, and Resident Evil 2. I'll begin reading shortly so we can continue with the book, but regulars will know that I love to discuss the books with you, the listeners, down in the comments, so I'm going to shout out a couple of people who commented on Resident Evil City of the Dead after the audiobook had finished. And those shout-outs begin with Ian Matthew Klein, who said something fascinating, said, I'm a virology and immunology PhD student at the University of Arizona. Each night, I've been wandering through our dark campus while listening to your videos. Resident Evil has been one of the most influential stories to my own life, and certainly one of my favourite stories. Thanks for having the perfect video to set the creepy mood. A student of virology and immunology this into Resident Evil. That is particularly spooky, not just for you, handling chemicals and never once knowing. Actually, you probably are quite intelligent and do know quite confidently that the chemicals and viruses and whatever you're handling isn't going to turn you into a zombie. But you never really know. Ooh. Or it could be much worse. Other listeners out there, this Ian Matthew Klein could be some form of umbrella agent themselves, the ideal person to create the virus that will kill us all. Well, Ian Matthew Klein, I hope you continue to comment and convince me that you're not some evil mastermind. There are a few other people I'd like to talk to, but I'll do that later on in between the other chapters. For now, let's start reading the prologue. And the prologue in this book begins just as it did in Resident Evil City of the Dead, with a series of newspaper clippings. Raccoon Times, July 24th, 1998. Spencer Mansion destroyed an explosive fire. Raccoon City. At approximately 2 a.m. Thursday morning, Victory Lake District residents were awakened by an explosive blast that thundered through the northwest raccoon forest, apparently caused by a fire that swept through the abandoned Spencer Mansion and ignited chemicals stored in the basement. Due to delays from the police barricades set up at the forest perimeter, in connection with the recent string of murders in Raccoon City, local firefighters were unable to salvage any part of the estate's grounds. After a three-hour battle against the raging fire, the 31-year-old mansion and adjacent servants' quarters were deemed a complete loss. Built by Lord Oswell Spencer, European aristocrat and one of the founders' worldwide pharmaceutical company, Umbrella, the estate was designed by award-winning architect George Trevor as a guest house for Umbrella VIPs and was closed down shortly after completion for reasons unknown. According to Amanda Whitney, spokesperson for the Umbrella Corporation, parts of the estate were still being used to store a number of industrial cleaning agents and solvents used by Umbrella. Whitney said in a statement yesterday that the company would take full responsibility for the unfortunate incident, calling it a serious oversight on our part. Those chemicals should have been cleared out of the Spencer house a long time ago, and we're just thankful that no one was hurt. At this point, the cause of the fire is undetermined, but Whitney went on to say that Umbrella will be bringing in their own investigators to sift through the ruins in hopes of determining the fire's point of origin. Raccoon Weekly, July 29, 1998. Stars taken off murder investigation. Raccoon City. In a surprising announcement by city officials at a press conference yesterday, the Raccoon City branch of the Special Tactics and Rescue Squad, STARS, was officially removed from the investigation into the nine brutal murders and five disappearances of city residents that have occurred in the last ten weeks. City Council member Edward Weist delivered the statement citing gross incompetence as the primary reason for the STARS removal. Readers may remember that the star's first action upon being assigned to the case last week 
was to search the northwest area of the forest for the alleged cannibal killers. Weist stated that it was because of their blatantly unprofessional conduct that their mission ended in disaster, resulting in the crash of a helicopter and the loss of six of their 11 team members, including the Star's branch commander, Captain Albert Wesker. After the Star's mishandling of the raccoon forest search, said Weist, we've decided to let the RPD see this investigation through to the conclusion. We have reason to believe that the stars may have been ingesting drugs and or alcohol prior to their search and have suspended the use of their services indefinitely. Weist was joined by Sarah Jacobson, representing Mayor Harris, and Police Commissioner J.C. Washington to make the announcement and answer questions. Neither Police Chief Brian Irons nor any of the surviving stars could be reached for comment. Cityside, August 3, 1998 Source of estate fire deemed accidental. Raccoon City. After an exhaustive investigation by fire officials working with Umbrella Incorporated, ISD Industrial Services Division, the fire that ravaged the company-owned Spencer Estate in Raccoon Forest late last month was determined to have been caused by carelessness on the part of person or persons unknown, as was announced in a press conference yesterday. Said ISD team leader David Bischoff, It looks like somebody tried to start a campfire in one of the mansion's rooms and things just got out of control. We found nothing to suggest arson or foul play of any kind. He went on to say that while the destruction of the property was total, there was no evidence that anyone was caught in the fire or subsequent explosion. Chief Brian Irons of the Raccoon City Police Department was in attendance at the conference and... When asked whether he believed the fire to be connected to the unsolved murders and disappearances plaguing the city, Irons stated that there was no way to be sure. Said Irons, At this point, anything I could say would only be speculation. Though I will say that the fact that the murders have stopped since the night of the fire seems to imply that perhaps the killers were hiding there. We can only hope that they've now left the area and will soon be apprehended. Chief Irons refused to comment on the allegations of gross misconduct by the stars in their brief assignment to the murder investigation, saying only that he agreed with the city council's decision and disciplinary actions are being considered. And that's our prologue. Okay, so we've set the scene a little bit. We know already that they are covering up what's happened at the Spencer Mansion, and they are blaming it on the stars, telling absolute lies, and of course... Creepy old Brian Irons is along with them, trying to put them in the ground. It's not much for the story so far, but we're about to jump into the first proper chapter. But first, I just want to say hi to Terry Williams, who says this is nice to listen to while I work. Very nice narration. Thank you very much, Terry. I always love helping people get through their job with these audiobooks. And to Pancho, who says I appreciate the commentary. Not really something I see often. Thanks very much, Pancho. I hope you continue to enjoy with us. And now, chapter one. Rebecca Chambers rode her mountain bike through the dark, winding streets of the Cider District, the late summer moon swelling in the warm, clear night overhead. Although it was relatively early, the suburban streets were deserted, the city-wide curfew still in effect. No one under 18 was supposed to be out after dusk until the murderers were caught and put safely behind bars. It had been a tense and quiet summer in Raccoon City, at least on the surface. She glided past silent houses, the faint glow of television sets spilling out across well-kept lawns, the distant drone of crickets and an occasional barking dog, the only sounds in the air that whipped past her. The uneasy citizens of Raccoon dwelled behind those locked doors, waiting for the announcement that the killers had been apprehended and that their city was safe. If only they knew. For just a moment, Rebecca envied them their ignorance. She'd come to the rather disheartening conclusion in the last couple of weeks that knowing the truth wasn't all it was cracked up to be, particularly when no one believed it. It had been a long, merciless thirteen days since the nightmare of the Spencer estate. The surviving stars had escaped treachery and death just to run up against a massive brick wall of scornful disbelief when they tried to tell their tale. Jill, Chris, Barry and herself had been labelled drug addicts and worse in local papers, undoubtedly at Umbrella's urging. And, after their suspension, 
Even the RPD had refused to believe them. Now with Umbrella taking over the investigation of the fire, undoubtedly getting rid of the last of the evidence, it was as if everywhere the stars turned, Umbrella had been there first, greasing palms and covering tracks, making it impossible to get anyone to listen to their story. Not that it would have been that simple anyway. One of the biggest, most respectable med research and pharmaceutical companies in the world, not to mention the primary source of income in Raccoon, conducting bioweapons research in a secret lab, creating experimental monsters? If I didn't know better, I'd probably think I was crazy too. At least, the absolute worst was over. With the lab destroyed, the attacks on Raccoon had stopped, and though the people responsible hadn't been held accountable yet, she figured it was only a matter of time. Umbrella was experimenting with dangerous stuff, and wouldn't be able to hide it from a star's investigation. She and the others just had to watch their backs until the home office sent back up. Speaking of... Ouch! The pancake holster was poking into her ribcage. Rebecca adjusted it through the thin cotton of her shirt, hoping that after tonight she wouldn't have to carry the weapon anymore. A snub-nosed thirty-eight revolver from Barry's collection. She couldn't speak for the others, but she hadn't had a decent night's sleep since they'd escaped the Spencer estate and walking around armed all of the time wasn't her idea of safe. Sighing inwardly, she took a left on Foster and pedalled through the shadows toward Barry's house, reminding herself that he'd probably called the meeting because he'd heard from the home office with orders. He could only say that there'd been a development, and to show up ASAP, and though she was trying not to let her imagination run away with her, she couldn't help the steady pulse of excitement that had knotted her stomach since he'd called. Maybe they'll fly us to New York to brief the investigation team, or even to Europe for when they storm Umbrella's headquarters. Wherever they were sent, it had to be better than staying in Raccoon. The strain of looking over their shoulders had been getting to them all. Chris seemed to think that Umbrella was waiting until the public eye was off the stars before making their move, though it was only a theory, and not exactly the most reassuring thought to fall asleep by. Chicken Heart Vickers had skipped out of town after only two days, unable to take the pressure. And although Jill, Chris, and Barry had condemned Brad's cowardice, Rebecca was starting to wonder if maybe the Alpha Pilot didn't have the right idea. It wasn't that she wanted Umbrella to walk. There was no question that their experiments were morally reprehensible, and certainly illegal. But until the stars sent help, staying in Raccoon City was dangerous. Not after tonight. Just a little bit longer, and this'll all be over. No more guns. No more locked doors. No more worrying about what Umbrella will do to us for knowing the truth. When they'd first made the report, their superiors in New York had told them to stay put. Assistant Director Kurtz himself had promised to do some investigating and to get back to them. But it had been eleven days and still no word. She had no intention of running away, as Brad had done, but she'd come to hate the feeling of that holster, the way to the deadly steel against her side every waking moment of every day. She was supposed to be a chemist, for Christ's sake. And once the reinforcements come, maybe they'll move me to one of the labs, let me study the virus. Technically, I'm still a Bravo. There's no way they'd want me on the front lines. There was no question that it would be the best use of her talents. The others were experienced soldiers, but Rebecca had only been with the stars for five weeks. Her first mission had been the one to Raccoon Forest that had wiped out over half the team and clued the rest of them in to Umbrella's secret. Since then, she'd spent a lot of time brushing up on the molecular architecture of viruses, trying to determine the T-virus replication strategy. The stars didn't need field medics right now, they needed scientists. And if she'd learned anything from the Spencer estate disaster, it was that she belonged in a lab. She'd held her own that night. But she also knew that working with the T-virus was the greatest contribution she could make towards stopping Umbrella. And you may as well face it, her mind whispered. You're fascinated by it. The chance to study an unclassified emerging mutagen. To find out what makes it tick. That's what makes you tick. Yeah, 
Well, there was no shame in enjoying her work. She joined the stars in hopes of just such an opportunity, and, with any luck, after tonight's meeting, she would be packing a bag and getting the hell out of Raccoon City, heading into a new phase of her life as a star's biochemist. She pulled to a stop at the end of the block in front of a huge, two-story, remodeled Victorian, painted a pale yellow, checking all around for anything suspicious before getting off her bike. The Burtons lived next to a sprawling suburban park, heavy with trees. Even a few weeks ago, she might have wandered through the silent park, enjoying the balmy summer night, looking at the stars. Now it was just one more dark place for someone to hide. Shivering slightly in spite of the warm, humid air, she hurried up the front walk. Dragging her bike onto the porch, she wiped sweat from the back of her neck and checked her watch. She'd made excellent time. Only twenty minutes since Barry's call. Rebecca leaned the bicycle against the railing, praying that he had good news. Before she could knock, Barry opened the door, dressed in a t-shirt and jeans, his heavily muscled body filling the door's frame. Barry lifted weights with a vengeance. He smiled and stood back to let her inside, taking a quick look out at the quiet street before following her into the front hall. His Colt Python was tucked into a hip holster, making him look like an overgrown cowboy. You see anybody? he asked lightly. She shook her head. No, I took the back streets too. Barry nodded, and though he was still smiling a little, she could see the haunted look in his eyes. The look he'd had ever since their narrow escape. She wished she could tell him that nobody blamed him, but knew it wouldn't make a difference. Barry still held himself responsible for a lot of what had happened at the estate that night. He looked as though he was losing weight, too, though she figured that that had more to do with him missing his wife and kids. He'd sent them out of town, immediately following the incident, terrified for their safety. Just one more way that Umbrella has damaged our lives. He led her through the spacious hallway, past the stairs, the walls decorated with framed drawings in the canyon that his daughters had made. The Burton house was rambling and spacious, filled with the scuffed and well-worn furnishings that epitomized family. Chris and Jill should be here any time. You want some coffee? He seemed tense, scruffing nervously at his short red beard. No thanks. Maybe some water? Yeah, sure. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'll be back in a minute. He hurried off to the kitchen before she could ask him if anything was wrong. Introduce myself? What's going on? She walked through the hall's arched opening into the cluttered, comfortable living room and stopped, a little startled to see a strange man sitting in one of the recliners. He stood up as soon as she entered the room, smiling, but she could see by the way his dark gaze narrowed slightly that he was sizing her up. Even a few weeks ago, the careful scrutiny would have made her horribly self-conscious. She was the youngest STARS member ever to be accepted for active duty and knew that she looked like it. But if anything positive had come from the incident at the Umbrella Lab, it was that she was no longer so caring about things like social embarrassment. Facing down a house full of monsters tended to put things into perspective that way. Besides which, being stared at had gotten pretty routine since then. She gazed back at him impassively, studying him in return. Jeans, a nice shirt, running shoes. He also wore a hip holster with a 9mm Beretta, the star's standard issue sidearm. He was tall, maybe a full foot over her 5 foot 3 inch frame, but slender, with a physique like a swimmer's. He was almost movie star handsome, a high weathered brow and finely chiseled features, short dark hair and a piercing gaze that sparkled with intelligence. You must be Rebecca Chambers, he said. He had a British accent, his words clipped and somehow polished. You're a biochemist, is that right? Rebecca nodded. Working on it? And you are? He smiled wider, shaking his head. Forgive my manners, please. I hadn't expected... That is, I... He stepped around Barry's low coffee table and extended his hand, flushing slightly. I'm David Trapp, with the star's Exeter branch in Maine, he said. Rebecca felt cool relief wash over her. 
The stars had sent help instead of calling. Fine by her. She shook his hand, stifling a grin, knowing that her appearance had thrown him. Nobody expected an 18-year-old scientist, and while she'd gotten used to the surprise looks, she still took a kind of mischievous pleasure at catching people off guard. So, are you like the scout or something? she asked. Mr. Trapp frowned. Sorry? For the investigation. Are there other teams already here? Or did you come to check things out first to get the dirt on Umbrella? She trailed off as he shook his head slowly, almost sadly, his dark eyes glittering with an emotion she couldn't read. It came out in his voice, heavy with frustrated anger, and as the words sank in, Rebecca felt her knees go watery with a sudden, anxious dread. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Miss Chambers. I have reason to believe that Umbrella has gotten to key members of the stars, either by bribery or by blackmail. There is no investigation, and no one else is coming. A look of confused terror passed through the girl's light brown eyes, and just as quickly was gone. She took a deep breath and blew it out. Are you sure? I mean, did Umbrella try to get to you, or... Are you positive? David shook his head. I'm not absolutely certain, no, but I wouldn't be here if I wasn't... concerned about it. It was a bit of an understatement, but David wasn't past the shock of seeing how young she was, and felt an almost instinctive desire not to alarm her any further. Barry had mentioned that she was something of a child genius, but he hadn't really expected a child. The biochemist wore high tops and cut-off denim shorts rolled at the knee, topped by a shapeless black t-shirt. Get past it, this child may be the only scientist we have left. The thought rekindled the anger that had been burning in David's gut for the past few days. The story that had been unfolding since Barry's call wasn't a pretty one. Filled with treachery and lies, and the fact that the stars, his stars, were involved. Barry walked into the room with a glass of water, and Rebecca took it from him gratefully, swallowing half of it in one gulp. Barry shot him a glance, and then turned his attention to Rebecca. He told you, huh? The girl nodded. Did Jill and Chris know? Not yet. It's why I called, Barry said. Look, no point in going through this twice. We should wait for them to show up before we get into specifics. Agreed, David said. He generally found that first impressions were the most telling, and if they were going to be working together, he wanted to get a feel for the girl's character. The three of them sat, and Barry started to tell Rebecca how he and David had met back in stars training, when they were both much younger men. Barry told a good story, even if it was only to kill time. David listened with half an ear, as Barry related an anecdote about their graduation night, involving a rather humorless drill sergeant and several rubber snakes. The girl was relaxing, even enjoying the story of their childish prank. Seventeen years ago, she would have been celebrating her first birthday. Still, she had put her questions on hold at Barry's request, even though David knew she had to be anxious about what he'd told her. The ability to retrain one's focus so quickly was an admirable trait, one that he'd never fully mastered. He'd been able to think of little else since his own call to the stars A.D., David's devotion to the organization had made the apparent betrayal all the more bitter, like a bad taste in his mouth that wouldn't go away. The stars had been David's life for almost twenty years, had given him all the things he'd lacked growing up, a sense of self-worth, a sense of purpose and integrity. And just like that, the lives of dedicated men and women, my life and life's work simply tossed aside as if it meant nothing. How much did that cost? How much did Umbrella have to pay to buy the star's honour? David shook the anger, focusing his attention on Rebecca. If all he'd learned was true, time was short and their resources were now severely limited. His motivations weren't as important right now as hers. He could tell by the way she held herself that she wasn't the shy or submissive type, and she was obviously bright. Her eyes fairly sparkled with it. 
From what Barry had told him, she'd acted professionally throughout the Spencer facility operation. Her file suggested that she was more than qualified to work with the chemical virus, assuming that she was as good as the report said. And assuming she has any desire to put her life in further danger. That was going to be the sticking point. She hadn't been with the stars for very long, and knowing that they'd sold their people out probably wasn't going to overwhelm her with feelings of confidence for the job ahead. It would be just as easy for her to step out of the game for now. For that matter, it would be the intelligent choice for all of them. There was a knock at the door, presumably the other two Alfreds. David's hand drifted down to the butt of his 9mm as Barry went to answer. When he walked back in, leading the Stars team members, David relaxed, then stood up to be formally introduced. Jill Valentine, Chris Redfield, this is Captain David Trapp, military strategist from the main Stars Exeter branch. Chris was the marksman, if David remembered correctly, and Jill was something of a covert B&E specialist. Barry said that the pilot, Brad Vickers, had skipped town shortly after the Spencer incident. No great loss from what he could gather. The man sounded distinctly unreliable. He shook both hands, and then they all sat down. Barry nodded toward him. David's an old comrade of mine. We worked together on the same team for about two years, right after the boot camp. He showed up on my doorstep about an hour ago with news, and I didn't think it could wait. David? David cleared his throat, trying to focus on the significant facts. After a pause, he began at the beginning. As you already know, six days ago, Barry placed several calls to various stars' branches to see if any word had come from the home office about the tragedy that occurred here. I received one of those calls. It was the first I'd heard about it, and I've since found out that the New York office hasn't contacted anyone about your discovery. No warnings or memos. Nothing has been issued to the stars regarding the Umbrella Corporation. Jill and Chris exchanged looks of concern. Maybe they're not done investigating, Chris said slowly. David shook his head. I spoke to the assistant director myself the day after Barry called. I didn't tell him about the contact, only that I'd heard a rumour of a problem in Raccoon and wanted to know if it had any merit. He looked at the assembled group and sighed inwardly, feeling like he'd already gone over it a thousand times. Only in my mind, searching for another answer, and there isn't one. The AD wouldn't tell me anything outright, he continued, and he told me that I should remain quiet about it until official word came down. What he would say was that there had been a helicopter crash in Raccoon City, and what he implied was that the surviving stars were trying to lay blame on Umbrella, angry over some sort of funding dispute. But that's not true, Jill said. We were investigating the murders and found... Yes, Barry told me. David interrupted. You found that the murders were the result of a laboratory accident. The T-virus that Umbrella was experimenting with was released somehow, and it transformed the researchers into mad killers. That's exactly what happened, Chris said. I know it sounds nuts, but we were there. We saw them. David nodded. I believe you. I have to admit I was skeptical after speaking with Barry. As you say, it sounds nuts. But my call to New York and what's happened since has all changed that. I've known Barry for a long time and I knew that he wouldn't be looking to place blame for such an unfortunate incident unless Umbrella was, in fact, responsible. He even told me about his own unwilling involvement in the attempted cover-up. But if Tom Kurtz told you that there was no conspiracy, Chris said. David sighed. <sighs> yes, we have to assume that either our own organization has been misled, or that, like your Captain Wesker, Members of the stars are now working for Umbrella. There was a moment of shocked silence as they absorbed the information, and David could see anger and confusion play across their faces. He knew how they felt. It meant that star's directors had either been manipulated by Umbrella or corrupted by them. And either way, the survivors of the raccoon team had been hung out to dry, left vulnerable to whatever Umbrella might do. God. If only I could believe that it was all a mistake. Three days ago, I picked up a tale on my way into work. 
he said softly. I wasn't able to make them, but I'm assuming they're some sort of umbrella people, and that my call to New York was responsible. Have you tried to get hold of Palmieri? Jill asked. David nodded. The star's national commander was the one man he knew was above taking bribes. Marco Palmieri had been with the star since the very beginning. I was informed by his secretary that he's leading a classified operation in the Middle East and won't be available for months. And word has it that arrangements are being made for his retirement while he's away. You think Umbrella's behind it? Chris asked. David shrugged. Umbrella has made substantial donations to the stars over the years, which means they have contacts. If they're trying to turn the stars away from investigating them, getting rid of Dr. Palmieri would be to their advantage. David glanced around the room, trying to assess their readiness for the rest of it. Barry's fists were clenched, and he stared at them as if he'd never seen them before. Jill and Rebecca both seemed lost to thought, though he could see that they had accepted his story as truth. It would save them time, at least. Chris stood up and started to pace, his youthful features flushed with anger. So, basically, we've got no credibility with the locals, no backup coming, and we've been branded as liars by our own people. The Umbrella investigation is dead, and we're screwed. Does that pretty much sum it up? David could see that the anger wasn't directed at him, just as the anger that he felt wasn't for the young Alpha. The thought of what Umbrella had done, what the stars were involved in, it made him sick with rage with feelings of helplessness that he hadn't felt since his childhood. Stop thinking of yourself. Tell them the rest. David stood and looked at Chris, though he addressed all of them. He hadn't even had time to tell Barry yet. Actually, there's more. It seems that there's another umbrella facility on the main coast, conducting experiments with this virus of theirs. And, just like what happened here, they've lost control. David turned to Rebecca, taking in her wide, horrified gaze as he finished. I'm taking a team in without Star's authorization, and I want you to come with us. And that's our slightly dramatic end to chapter one. Oh, Rebecca, I'm sorry. You wanted to stay off the front lines, but as it turns out, five foot three biochemists are desperately needed on the front line wars against Umbrella and their zombies. Now, we've uh, talked a lot about adaptation here on the Fulcrum Entertainment channel, particularly in yesterday's live Fulcrum Entertainment podcast episode featuring our guest, the Joker Voice. You might want to go check that out. But talking specifically about Resident Evil adaptation, I often am interested to know people's thoughts on where S.D. Perry gets it wrong with the books. For example, this is saying that Brad Vickers has already left Raccoon City, but of course we know Brad has to still be there because he gets killed in Resident Evil Nemesis. Although I suppose it is possible that Brad could have come back, maybe on some weird spike of courage to try and save his friends from the zombie-infested city although it doesn't seem very much in his character. How do you guys feel about that inconsistency? We're also going to have it as well with Jill and with Chris and about what they do. I personally give it a pass because these books really came out very close to the games pretty much as they came out. So I know that the author wouldn't have had all of the story details. And frankly, a lot of the things that S.D. Perry writes do make a lot of sense within the world, certainly within the world of her books. Also, to quickly go back to uh, our commenter Ian Matthew Klein and the virology and immunology studies, uh, Rebecca Chambers, when she was talking about how fascinating it would be to study the T-virus, how it was the sort of thing that she wanted, was reminding me of you and your studies, and in fact making me even more suspicious that you are in fact an umbrella virus creator. Mm. Can't trust you, sir. Can't trust you. Before I move on and start reading again, let's just say hi to Iduna's Apple. Um, I said hi on a live stream before Iduna, but thank you so much for the really interesting and thought out comments that you've been putting on the Resident Evil City of the Dead audiobook. It's fantastic to have these discussions. Um, the things you've been saying about Ada and Leon's relationship are wonderful, insightful and funny. Thank you so much. I'll just quickly read out one of your comments that said, I actually bought this book and I never found the time to read it. And my concentration isn't what it used to be. So this is very helpful and I enjoy it very much. That 
is wonderful, and I love to hear that. I love to hear that people have supported the authors, because I love Esty Perry. I think her work is fantastic. And I love to hear that these audiobooks are helping you guys either get through your work or help you listen to books that you don't have time to read, because I completely understand that. If you're in that situation, please tell me. Heck, if you have like a book that you have bought and you haven't read, and you're like, I'd love to know that, but I don't have the time to read it, put it in the comments. Make it a recommendation. We might be able to get it on the channel for you. And while you're thinking about what you'd like me to read next, I'm going to start on chapter two. They all stared at David, Chris feeling like he'd just been punched in the gut. He was still reeling from the information about the stars, from the realisation that they were on their own, and now another job? And he wants to take Rebecca? David went on, his dark gaze still fixed on the young Bravo. I've talked to the people on my team I believe to be trustworthy, and three of them have agreed to go. I'm not going to lie to you. It will be dangerous. And without the stars to back us up, there's no guarantee we'll be able to close the lab down. We just want to go in, collect some solid evidence on this T-virus, and get back out before anyone else knows we're... Before he could stop himself, Chris interrupted. I'm going too. We all go. Barry said firmly. Jill nodded, putting her arm around Rebecca. The teen seemed flustered, her cheeks red, and looking at her, Chris was once again reminded of Claire. It was more than just a physical resemblance. Rebecca had the same wit, the same spirited blend of courage and thoughtfulness that Chris's younger sister had. And since the Spencer estate, Chris had come to feel just as protective of Rebecca. Too many of his friends had died already. Joseph, Richard, Kenneth, Forrest, and Enrico. Not to mention Billy Robertson. His body had never been found, but Chris had no doubt that Umbrella had killed him to keep him from talking. It wasn't that Rebecca couldn't handle herself. But damn it, she's part of our team. No way she goes without us. David shook his head. Look, this isn't a full-scale op. Five people is already stretching it. Rebecca's got the background we need to find the data on the virus, and she already knows what symptoms to look for. You've got your team right here, Chris said. You can take us instead. Let you guys look into the cover-up. David sat back down and looked at Chris, his face expressionless. Tell me who's involved in Umbrella's conspiracy to hide their research, he said. Chris glanced at the others, then back at David, determined not to let his confusion show. We suspect several people locally. Umbrella's office workers, of course, the police commissioner, Chief Irons, a couple of his men. David nodded. And now that it looks like the stars are in on this, what do you propose to do? Where the hell is he going with this? Chris sighed. I don't know. I... We should contact the feds, uh, maybe an internal affairs division, to look into the stars in the RPD. Barry cut in. And we'll get in touch with some of the other stars branches. There are still good people working out there who ain't going to be too happy that Umbrella's taken over. David nodded again. So you agree that Umbrella has to be stopped even though it will be dangerous? Well, no shit, Chris said, scowling angrily. We can't just sit around and do nothing. There's no telling what could happen if the T-virus gets out again. And what can you tell me about the classification of the virus? David asked quietly. Chris opened his mouth to answer and then closed it, staring at David thoughtfully. I was about to say you should ask Rebecca, and he knows it. David stood up and looked at all of them in turn as he spoke, his voice intense and determined. I agree Umbrella has to be stopped, but let's not kid ourselves. We're talking about breaking from the stars and going up against a multi-billion dollar establishment on our own. Nowhere is going to be safe. And our only chance of success is if we each do what we can, what we're good at, to take Umbrella down. He fixed his cool gaze on Chris, as if he realised that Chris was the one who had to be convinced. You and Jill and Barry already know what to look for here, and you've been with the stars longer than Rebecca. You should stay here, out of sight. See if you can ferret out the connection between the local police and Umbrella, and reach out to the STARS members that you think would help us. David turned to Rebecca again. And, if you agree, I think we should leave for Maine tonight, 
With the information I have, it looks as though things have already gotten out of hand. My team is standing by. We could go in tomorrow at dusk. The room was silent for a moment, the only sound that of the ceiling fan whirring overhead. Chris still felt angry, but couldn't find a hole in the man's logic. He was right about their options, and whether Chris liked it or not, the choice to go to Maine was Rebecca's to make. What information do you have? Jill asked thoughtfully. How did you find out about the lab? David reached down to a battered briefcase propped next to his chair and dug through it, pulling out a file folder. An interesting story in itself, if a strange one. I was hoping that one of you might be able to decipher some of this. He laid out three sheets of paper on the coffee table as he spoke, what looked like photocopies of newspaper clippings and a simple diagram. Shortly after I talked to the Home Office, I received a visit from a stranger, a man who claimed to be a friend of Starr's. He told me his name was Trent, and he gave me these. Trent? Jill broke in excitedly. She turned to Chris, her eyes wide, and Chris felt his heart skip a beat. He'd almost forgotten about their mysterious benefactor. The guy who told Jill to watch out for traitors, who told Brad where to pick us up. David stared at Jill, his expression puzzled. You'd know him. Just before we went in to rescue the Bravos, a man named Trent gave me some information about the Spencer estate and warned me about Wesker, Jill said. He was quite the piece of work, real shady. He didn't give anything away, you know. But he knew what was going on with Umbrella and what he did tell me all panned out. Barry nodded. And Brad Vickers said that Trent called in the estate's coordinates right after Wesker activated the triggering system. If he hadn't radioed in, we would have blown up with the rest of the damn mansion. Chris suddenly realized that he had a serious headache brewing as they all gathered around Barry's coffee table, staring down at the papers. The stars were working for Umbrella. There was another T-virus facility opening in Maine, and now Trent, again popping up like some cryptic fairy godmother, his motives impossible to guess at. It was like some kind of a game. The stakes all or nothing as they struggled to get to the bottom of Umbrella's conspiracy. And we have no choice but to play. But whose game are we playing? And what do we risk losing if we fail? Chris shot an unhappy glance at Rebecca, thinking again of his kid sister, and wishing, not for the first time, that they had never heard of Umbrella. David watched them study the information that Trent had given him, somehow not surprised that the enigmatic stranger had contacted the stars before. The man had been a professional, though at what, precisely, David couldn't imagine. Why would he want to help us fight Umbrella? What's in it for him? David thought back to the brief encounter he'd had only five days ago, searching his memory for some additional clues, something he'd missed. He'd arrived home late from work, and it had been raining. Pouring, a thunderstorm that beaded the windows and masked the sound of his gentle knocking. The Exeter stars had enjoyed an easy summer, more paperwork than action. The Bravos had taken off for a criminal profiling seminar in New Hampshire, and David had been entertaining thoughts of packing a bag and attending the final days until he'd received Barry's call, followed by the first hint from the home office that something was wrong. He'd spend the next day calling a few of his branch contacts with discreet questions and digging through files on Umbrella, not making it home until almost midnight. The driving rain had ushered him into his cold, dark house, the atmosphere matching his mood perfectly. He poured a scotch and collapsed on the couch his head spinning from the implications of what he'd learned, that either his old friend Barry was lying, or that the AD for the stars was. The rapping at his door was so soft that he missed it at first, the steady rain hammering on the roof, covering the sound. Then it grew louder. Frowning, David looked at his watch and walked slowly toward the door, wondering who the hell came calling in the middle of the night. He lived alone and had no family. It had to be work, or maybe someone with car trouble. He cracked the door open and saw a man in a black trench coat standing on his porch, 
streams of water running down his lined face. The stranger smiled, an open, friendly expression, his eyes glittering bright with humour. David Trapp? David took in the man at a glance, tall and thin, maybe a few years past David's age, say forty-two or forty-three. His dark hair was plastered to his skull by the rain, and he held a large manila envelope in one gloved hand. Yes? The man grinned wider. My name is Trent, and this is for you. He held out the damp envelope, and David glanced at it warily, not sure if he should take it. Mr. Trent didn't seem dangerous, or at least not threatening. But he was still a stranger, and David preferred to know the people he accepted gifts from. Do I know you? David asked. Trent shook his head, his smile unwavering. No, but I know you, Mr. Trapp, and I also know what you're about to go up against. Believe me, you're going to need all the help you can get. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, perhaps you have me confused with someone else? Trent's smile faded as he extended the envelope, his dark eyes narrowing slightly. Mr. Trapp, it's raining, and this is for you. Confused and not a little irritated, David opened the door wider to accept the envelope. As soon as he grasped it, Trent turned and started to walk away. Uh, hold on for a moment. Trent ignored him, disappearing into the rain-drenched shadows around the side of the house. David stood in the doorway, uncertainly, holding the damp paper and staring into the pouring darkness for another minute before going back inside. Once he'd studied the contents, he wished he'd gone after Trent, but by then, of course, it was too late. Too late, and only too obvious what he'd meant. He knew about Umbrella and the stars. But who does he work for? And why did he choose to contact me? Jill and Rebecca were studying the map while Barry and Chris worked through the copied newspaper articles. There were four of them, all recent, all centred around the tiny coastal town of Caliban Cove, Maine. Three of them concerned the disappearances of local fishermen, all presumed dead. The fourth, was a rather humorous piece about the ghosts that haunted the cove. It seemed that several townspeople had heard strange sounds floating across the waters late at night, described as the cries of the damned. The writer of the article had laughingly suggested that the witnesses to the phenomena should probably stop drinking their mouthwash before bed. Funny, unless you know what we know about Umbrella. The map was of the stretch of the coast just south of the small town, an aerial sketch of the cove itself. David had uncovered a few facts about the area on a visit to Exeter's library, uncomfortable using the star's computer after Barry's call. The rather isolated stretch had been privately owned for several years, bought up by an anonymous group. There was a defunct lighthouse on the northern rim of the inlet, sitting atop a cliff that was supposedly riddled with sea caves. Trent's map showed several structures behind and below the lighthouse, leading down to a small pier on the southern tip of the open crescent. There was a notched border that ran the length of the cove on the inland side, presumably a fence. Caliban Cove was written across the top in bold letters. In smaller type, just beneath, were the words UMB Research and Testing. The third piece of paper that Trent had given him was the one that David didn't understand. There was a short list of names at the top, seven in all. Lyle Armon, Alan Kinnison, Tom Athens, Louis Thurman, Nicholas Griffith, William Birkin, and Tiffany Chin. Just under it was a somewhat poetic list of sorts, set into the centre of the page in curling font. Jill had picked it up again and was reading it carefully. She looked up at David, a half-smile on her face. No question that we got the same Trent here. This guy's into riddles. Any idea what it means? David asked. Jill sighed heavily. Well, 
One of the names here was in the material that Trent gave me, William Birkin. We figured out that at least some of the others were researchers at the Spencer facility, so I'm willing to bet those people also worked for Umbrella. Birkin may not have been at the estate when it was destroyed. I don't recognize any of the others. David nodded. I checked all of them with the STARS database and came up blank. The rest, though, is it a riddle of some sort? Jill glanced back at the paper, frowning as she read to herself again. Armand's message received. Blue series. Enter answer for key. Letters and numbers reverse. Time rainbow. Don't count. Blue to access. Rebecca took the paper from her as Jill looked back at David thoughtfully. A lot of what Trent gave me seemed like pretty random stuff, but some of it related to the Spencer Mansion secrets. Uh, the whole place was rigged with puzzle locks and traps. Maybe this is the same deal. It relates to something you'll find. Oh, shit. They all turned to Rebecca, who was staring at the top of the page, her face drained of color. She looked at David with an expression of anxious despair. Nicholas Griffith is on this list. David nodded. You know who he is? She looked around at all of them, her young face openly distressed. Yeah, except I thought he was dead. He was one of the greats, one of the most brilliant men ever to work in the biosciences. She turned back to David, her gaze heavy with dread. If he's with Umbrella, we've got a lot more to worry about than the T-virus getting out. He's a genius in the field of molecular virology, and if the stories are true, he's also totally insane. Rebecca looked back at the list, her stomach a leaden knot. Dr. Griffith? Still alive? And involved with Umbrella? Could today possibly get any worse? What can you tell us about him? David asked. Rebecca's mouth felt dry. She reached for her glass of water and drained it before looking at David. How much do you know about the study of viruses? She asked. He smiled a little. Nothing. That's why I'm here. Rebecca nodded, trying to think of where to start. Okay. Viruses are classified by their replication strategy and the type of nucleic acid in the virion. Uh, that's the specialized element in a virus that allows it to transfer its genome to another living cell. A, a genome is a single, a simple set of chromosomes. According to the Baltimore classification, there are seven distinct types of viruses, and each group infects certain organisms in a certain way. In the early 60s, a young scientist at a private university in California challenged the theory, insisting that there was an eighth group, one based loosely on DSDNA and SSDNA viruses, that could infect everything it contacted. It was Dr. Griffith. He published several papers, and while it turned out that he was wrong, his reasoning was brilliant. I know, I read them. The scientific community scoffed at his theory, but his research on virus-specified inclusions bodies in the cytoplasm without a linear genome... Rebecca trailed off, noticing the blank expressions on their faces. Uh, sorry. Anyway, Griffith stopped trying to prove the theory, but a lot of people were interested to see what he'd come up with next. Jill interrupted, frowning. Where did you learn all this? In school. One of my professors was a kind of science history buff. His speciality was defunct theories. And scandals. So what happened? David asked. The next time anyone heard from Griffith, it was because he'd gotten kicked out of the university. Dr. Vosh, uh, that's my prof, uh, told us that Griffith was officially fired for using drugs, uh, methamphetamines. But the rumor was that he'd been experimenting with drug-induced behavior modification on a couple of his students. Neither of them would talk, but one of them ended up in an asylum, and the other eventually committed suicide. Nothing was ever proved, but after that, no one would hire him. And as far as the facts go, that's the last anyone heard of Dr. Nicholas Griffith. But there's more to the story, David asked. Rebecca nodded slowly. 
In the mid-80s, a private lab in Washington was broken into by cops, and the bodies of three men were found, all dead of phylovirus infection. It was Marburg, one of the most lethal viruses there is. They'd been dead for weeks. Neighbors had complained because of the smell. The papers the police found in the lab suggested that all three men were research assistants to a Dr. Nicholas Dunn and that they had allowed themselves to be deliberately infected with what they understood to be a harmless cold virus. Dr. Dunn was going to see if he could cure it. She stood up, crossing her arms tightly. The agony those men must have endured. She'd seen pictures of Marburg victims. From the initial headache to extreme amplification in a matter of days. Fever, clotting, shock, brain damage, massive hemorrhaging from every orifice. They would have died in pools of their own blood. And your professor thought it was Griffith? Jill asked softly. Rebecca forced the images away and turned to Jill, finishing the story the way Dr. Vash had. Griffith's mother, her maiden name was Dunn. Barry let out a low whistle as Jill and Chris exchanged a worried look. David was studying her intently his gaze cool and unreadable. All the same, she thought she knew what was going through his mind. He's wondering if this changes things, if I'll go with him to see this Caliban Co. facility now that I know it's being run by people like Griffith. Rebecca looked away from David's intense scrutiny and saw that the rest of her team was watching her, their faces tight with concern. Since that terrible night at the Spencer estate, they'd become like a family to her. She didn't want to leave, to risk never seeing them again. But David's right. Without the support of the stars, nowhere will be safe for any of us, and this would be my chance to contribute, to do what I'm good at. She wanted to believe that it was the only reason that she'd be going to fight the good fight, but she couldn't help the tiny shiver of excitement that ran through her at the thought of getting her hands on the T-virus. It would be a golden opportunity to study the mutagen before anyone else, to categorize the effects and pick apart the virion right down to the smallest capsid. Rebecca took a deep breath and blew it out, her decision made. I'll do it, she said. When do we go? And there we have chapter two brought to an end. Okay, so we have our stage set. The scene is there. We are going to Maine to go fight zombies on the beach. <laughs> and we're going to be going forward with Rebecca Chambers as our protagonist for this book, which I find quite interesting. And I'm glad to sort of have this time with a character who isn't explored that much in the main series. Certainly not at this point. So again, this book originally came out in October. October 1998. So this is a long time before Resident Evil Zero. So we never really saw Rebecca as a main character or a playable character, I think. If uh, you guys can think of an earlier instance where she was a playable character in a game, um, please let me know. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of our video for today, so that is the last of it. But do not fear, my friends, not only will we be back with another part of Resident Evil Caliban Cove next week, but also we are currently running another audiobook here on the channel, Star Wars Death Troopers. So if you're not getting enough zombies on the beach, my friends, might I suggest you go over and listen to some zombies in space? Yeah. Links here at the end of the video and, of course, in the description. But before we leave for the week or move on to other audiobooks, I'm going to do as speedy as I can a rundown of a bunch of other people who commented from last time. So, uh, Julianne, who said, do more Resident Evil, please. Doing it right now, buddy. I hope you are enjoying. FBI1987, who I'm really happy that you have uh, commented, FBI, because, well, it's just nice to have someone who clearly knows these books, who says from uh, the very final part of the Resident Evil 2 audiobook, says, The funniest part of all of this is that you made David sound Texan, but he's British. And when you caught it, I laughed out loud. Uh, absolutely FBI shows how little I properly remember this book couldn't at all think that David was from the UK so I was like okay cool let's pick an American accent for this dude I don't know what's an easy one yeah, all right dear, I'm not gonna fight them there zombies 
absolutely wrong. Oh well, but loads of fun to have him now. I hope it's not being confusing, uh, switching between my voice and David's, because unfortunately they're a bit similar. The last uh, episode of the Resident Evil 2 audiobook got comments from loads of our regulars as well. Sweet Mango Limited, uh, thank you very much for commenting. We had Christopher Johnson, who's been enjoying these books. I really love it when you're around, Christopher Johnson. Thank you very much. Matt Curtis, of course, commented. We were talking a lot about uh, Mr. X. Um, 74 Widow X, my dude, Black Widow, the up-and-coming rapper. Haven't heard from you in a while, man. I hope you're doing well. Um, and who else do we have? Of course, Samuel Cuthbert, who, let me go find this. So Samuel Cuthbert was very helpful and answered our Resident Evil weapons question, which I am going to extend to any Resident Evil audiobook we ever do. Tell me about your favourite Resident Evil zombie killing weapons. So Samuel said, I would want the shotgun instead of the Desert Eagle, those being the two weapons that Leon was carrying in the last book. He says, one, it does a lot more damage. Two, it is more accurate, so it's a lot harder to miss your shot. And if you need to use it for a melee attack, you have much more reach than with a Desert Eagle, because frankly, I would want to be as far away from those hellish creatures as possible. And I frankly absolutely agree with you, and it is always a big big factor in zombies is reach. You must have something with that distance. Um, you know, that's why often, if you're going for a melee weapon, we want a long one. We want some form of spear, or, you know, like a broom. Okay, a broom's a bit of a downgrade from a spear, I'll admit. But, you know, something long, at least. Maybe tie a knife to your broom or something. No, I, I, sorry, we're having a bit of a, a bit of a comments jamboree at the end of this video here, because I've just seen one from Matt Curtis that I think's really fun. Ada and Leon, uh, with uh, little love heart emojis, in Pleasantville shooting zombies. We need a scene where she is gardening and singing about how much she loves Leon as she shoots a zombie, blood flying on the yellow daisies, which is an amazing, wonderful, funny image. Thank you so much, Mac. And I think I mentioned uh, in my reply back, it reminds me so much of of um, Little Shop of Horrors, where you have Audrey, and she has that musical number, uh, Somewhere That's Green, about her little life she wants to have, and I think it's so funny to imagine Ada in like a gingham dress with a little apron on, being, Leon, it's time for dinner, don't mind me, I'm just gonna kill all the zombies. <laughs> okay, 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 just two more, and then the video's done, and I'll leave you alone, I swear. So, Airlope22, I want to say thank you very much for commenting, uh, and frankly just uh give you a good thumbs up for absolutely spotting the plot twist of that uh, story straight away airlobe says i guarantee you that virus is in the girl's necklace mm -hmm. yeah it is sherry burke had been carrying that virus with her the entire time and lastly matt jansma who uh comes to my aid on the question of liquors and whether they are reptilian in origin and he says you know on the reptile subject you're right liquors are human origin if they have any reptile dna i'm not sure remake liquors look a lot less human but og liquors were a lot more human looking thanks for the audiobook it's great well thank you matt for commenting and for listening all right, that's it. I promised I'd be done, and I am done now. I will see you soon this week for Star Wars Death Troopers, if I haven't seen you already, and I'll see you soon again for the second part of Resident Evil Caliban Cove. I just have to quickly say, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon for this is YouTube, and we must feed the algorithm. Bye-bye.